Hey guys, it's Jason, the lead safety and technical trainer with Tyndale. Welcome back for another installment of 70E Made Easy. Today we're going to talk about Article 130.2, which is the EEWP, the Energized Electrical Work Permit. I'll probably refer to it as the EEWP from here on out. I want to start off by saying that there have been many accidents and fatalities because of this important step that has been skipped. Please note that this step is required when the equipment cannot be placed into an electrically safe work condition. So let's get to the text. 130.2a tells us when it is required, which is when work is performed as permitted in accordance with 110.2b, an energized electrical work permit shall be required and documented under any of the following conditions. Number one, when work is performed within the restricted approach boundary. Number two, when the employee interacts with the equipment, when the conductors or circuit parts are not exposed, but there is an increased likelihood of injury from an exposure to a north flash. I'm not going to get too much detail about the restricted approach boundary as I'm going to be covering that coming up very soon in a future episode. I do want to focus on number two, though. The word interacts is a very important word. One of the most common questions I get is, do I need PPE to operate a circuit breaker? The answer is exactly maybe. If you look back at 110.2b, you will see the requirements listed are based on a normal condition, and there are seven conditions to get through. So please check out that previous video where I explained most of that. Let's say you are justified in doing energized work. Now you need to fill out the EEWP. Let me first say that this is the minimum standard. There have been several companies that I have worked with that expand the EEWP quite a bit, it needs to be very personalized for your exact location and tasks. Next, what needs to be documented on the EEWP? Let's look at that. 130.2, the elements of a work permit. The work permit shall include, but not be limited to, the following items. Number one, a description of the circuit and equipment to be worked on and their location. This needs to be very specific and exact, like physical locations and circuit numbers, etc. Number two, the description of the work to be performed. Again, there needs to be care in the details, a specificity of detail of exactly what you are doing. Missed steps are dangerous and can cause accidents. Number three, justification for why the work must be performed in an energized condition. You need to look back at 110.2b. FYI, most work is not justifiable. Inconvenience and the unknowns are not enough. You can't just not shut off a panel to install a breaker because you think it may run your server room. That is not justification. Number four, description of the safe work practices to be employed. There are many, and again, may be very specific to your location. Some examples might be noting a special policy or exit strategy or procedure written for your current repair. You might note signage or specific tools needed to safely complete your task or a toolbox talk, JHA or a tailgate meeting. Number five, the electric shock risk assessment. And number six, the arc flash risk assessment. I'm gonna cover these in great detail in the next couple of episodes. So I'm not gonna get in the weeds on those on this video, so stay tuned. Number seven, the means employed to restrict the access of unqualified persons from the work area. Essentially, how are you going to keep people out of your work area? It's dangerous by exposed parts. I'm also going to cover this in a lot more detail coming up when we get to 130.80. So stay tuned for that future episode as well. Number eight, evidence of completion of a job briefing, including a discussion of any job specific hazards. I talked about that a second ago. Uh, with the job hazard analysis, the toolbox talks, tailgate meetings. But we also talked about this in a previous episode of 110.3i, which was an earlier episode. As I have said before, OSHA and attorneys don't care what you say. They care about what you document. This step has to include details and signatures. So be thorough. And now for my favorite, number nine, energized work approval. The authorizing or responsible management, safety officer, or owner, et cetera, has to sign this thing. That's right. Someone has to sign off on your task. Many times this requirement will reduce or if not eliminate the situations that you would normally work energized because that supervisor realized 
the magnitude of what their signature actually meant. Also remember, your employer is required to demonstrate that de-energization poses a greater life safety risk, which is often impossible. Finally, 130.2C gives us the four exceptions to the EEWP. The one I want to focus on is number one, is it applies every time for people doing walkout, tagout, and repairing equipment. Let's go to the text. Exemptions to work permit. Electrical work shall be permitted without an energized work permit if a qualified person is provided with and uses appropriate safe work practices and PPE in accordance with Chapter 1 under any of the following conditions. So the condition we're going to talk about is testing, troubleshooting, or voltage measuring. That means checking voltage, you're doing a lockout, tagout, you're doing a live dead live, uh, you know, resetting motor starters, etc. So in other words, when you lock out, tag out, you need to verify that that voltage is dead. As it says in the electrically safe work condition step number seven. So that was in a previous episode as well, if you want to turn back and look at that. Um, but for that, you don't need a signed off energize electrical work permit for that type of stuff. The moment you take tools out and start working in that enclosure, then you will need that. So please remember, you're still required to wear your shock PPE if it's over 50 volts and you're within that restricted approach boundary. And you're required to wear your arc flash PPE if it's required by the task or the incident energy study. I will cover some of these steps in detail in future episodes. Also, it's important to note that an energized electric work permit is a good option for any situation that has a risk of injury from exposed parts. That's all I got for you today. We're going to see you next time when I cover 130.4, which is the electric shock risk assessment. Thanks a lot for joining me today. Stay safe out there.